before we begin, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you in the name of Christ, and we come asking that you would reveal to us again the truth of your scriptures and help us to understand those things that, that prevent us from trusting you as we ought to. Welcome and uh, once again to Faith Reformed Baptist Church. We will continue in our study of Romans chapter 8, and tonight we are looking at Romans chapter 8, and we are in particular looking at verse number 29. Now, if you're looking closely, you may say, well, I, I don't think we covered all the verses up to verse number 29. Well, we will eventually cover them all, but I wanted to cover a topic tonight, and then we will go back and surely cover these verses multiple times. So, uh, fret not, uh, we will cover every verse. And tonight's message is concerning our idea of what the foreknowledge of God is about. But I'd like to have a very brief overview, so I would like to take a look at verse number 27, and I'll be reading that scripture to you now. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now with that, what we have is a very brief synopsis of what we've been going through over the past couple weeks how that God, through our hope in the promises and the gift of His Spirit to us in helping us understand ourselves and most importantly, seeking and finding what is within us and in interceding to the Father for us. Because the Lord has revealed many things to us in such a way that sometimes we just don't even understand them ourselves. We know that the world is, and, and, and I can't say it in a better way, messed up. It is so awfully messed up. It is, so, it is such a pit of evil that we just have to shake our heads. And sometimes without the knowledge and our dependence upon God, it can, be, it can throw us into depression. And so what we have here is kind of a, a summation of last week's sermon that we find in verse number 27. He that searcheth the hearts, that is the Holy Spirit, and he knows the mind of his Father, he knows the mind of Christ, he knows the mind of the Spirit, and therefore he is the perfect one to intercede for us because he makes intercession for the saints. And now with the next phrase, according to the will of God. This is something that we would desire. This reminds me of that scripture in Deuteronomy 29, 29, where uh, Moses is reminding us that the things that are revealed belong to us, but the things that are not revealed, they belong to God. And so we have two categories, right? The things that he tells us and the things, well, everything else. Now, we can say, well, there's so much that God has told us. Yeah, compare that to what he hasn't told us. Okay? And so we have been given all that we need to live a holy life. And that is supposed to prepare us with patience, with faith, to endure all the other things that we don't know about. In other words, our love of God prepares us to rest in Him, to rely upon Him. It's when we say like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. We give to God everything, everything, and put it in his hands, and he can destroy us without a doubt. He could, but he says he loves us. If God be for us, who's going to be against us? And therefore, all the things that we don't know, and for the world, that's everything. But for us, that's the things that are not revealed. And it says, according to the will of God. Now, we want to pray according to the will of God. And so we must want what God wants. And therefore, we can groan when we see sin. Shall we say, it seems like it's overcoming in the world. It's winning. On every hand, it seems like every generation, there's going to be something that says, who? Is God ever going to win? 
And then we see revivals here, we see revivals there, we read about it in history. We even experience it a little time, a little once in a while in our lives. But it seems like there's always the presence of sin and in the corruption. However, Paul continues with this in mind in verse number 28. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. If you'll notice, that's not what I'm preaching on tonight. I'm preaching on the next verse. However, there are two phrases that kind of are preparing my message, and that is the last phrase of verse 27, according to the will of God, he intercedes for us. He knows and he prays and he does these things according to his will. But also, all things are going to work to the good of those who love God according to his purpose. Those two things, according to the will of God and according to his purpose. And with those two phrases in mind, he begins from number 29, for whom he did foreknow. And that's where I'm going to begin. Now, I'm going to have a little preface of what I want you to understand about foreknowledge, and then we're going to go back, I'm going to give you about a, a 15 cent sermon on verse number 28, and then go in to verse number, uh, you know, the next one. But, there is in my lifetime, uh, a preoccupation with the future, especially when it comes to uh, uh, stories or fiction. There is actually a genre of science fiction just for time travel. Did you know that? Like, you can go to a bookstore and you say, oh, you want to look at the science fiction? Well, what kind of science fiction? We have this, 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 we have time travel. And so all the books about time travel is in one place. And within my lifetime, it seems as though there is a, a huge number of people that, that assume time travel is, is one of those things that we're going to do one day. Like, like jump on a Concorde plane and fly to France in two hours one day, we're going to get inside a, uh, I don't know, a, a police box and, and jump through time. I don't really think that's going to happen, folks. I really don't. Even with all the science that we have, you see, now, what I, the reason I'm telling you this is that there is a difference between biblical preaching of doctrine and philosophy and then fantasy. They're really different. So I want to compare the difference to make sure you're not caught up with the idea that, oh, I believe the Bible, but you know what? I believe one day that we're going to go back in time. Of, no, no, just, let's just think about this a few minutes. Because the foreknowledge of God is important to us. Some people seem to think that God looks into the future and finds something there, as though it's already there. Like he... He thinks, okay, let me, let me project myself into the future. And I get to walk around and see the things that are going to happen. And there's my great, 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 great grandchildren playing ball. And he's looking at them. And do you have any idea what this type of thinking does to you? This is God discovering things. God discovering things. God finding, God going, look. If God ever had one of those moments, we are doomed. We are doomed if God is ever surprised or ever learns anything. Therefore, the very idea that has been planted in so many people, time travel, or God looks into the future to see whatever, to see who's going to believe, and then he will then elect them. Kind of like, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I meant. That's one of my people, even though I found out they were going to do it, and then I said, I chose him. <laughs> you know, we would, if that happened today, we would say, insider information, he's a cheat, prosecute him. Right? Like our Congress, you know, they have, they, they, they were allowed to buy stock based upon insider information on companies that they're about to make laws about. And then they would say, okay, we can't do this, we can't do that. This company is not going to be able to do this. 
and then they go off to the side, sell all their stock, make millions, but you are not allowed to do it. God is not like that insider man. God is not like that person. Even though you may enjoy discovery, it would dethrone God. I just want you to get the idea when we get into the, to the understanding of foreknowledge that God does not discover what's going to happen. He just doesn't find out anything. He doesn't figure it out. God is not one of us who has these great achievements and we are so proud of ourselves and say, look at this math. That was hard and I figured it out. I'm a mathematician. God created all things. Math is nothing to him. Everything about all that God does is nothing to him. It is described as the dust on the scales. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of my philosophy based upon my understanding of biblical doctrine. But there are some things I cannot prove. And so I have to tell you this is my idea because this is not thus saith the Lord. But I want you to get an understanding of foreknowledge that is more biblical than Star Trek. That is more biblical than Doctor Who. And more biblical than even the best professors in our universities that claim Einstein says that we can stop or improve or speed up time or do that type of thing. I'm just telling you the truth, okay? But think of it like this. I do not believe that the future has happened yet. Like that is some type of, you know, great discovery. But to some people's thinking, if they truly believe that God can look into the future, it has already happened in God's mind or whatever realm they want to say, like a realm, I don't even know what that means when it comes to truth. You know, like a different dimension or a different whatever the case may be. But they say, well, God is above time and so he can go here and here and, and this and that. Look, the scriptures tell us these two things, according to his will, according to his purpose. Do you know what God has that I know that he has, that the word reveals that he has? A plan. God has a plan. Now, people that have plans, do you know what they do when they follow them? They complete the plan. Now, when I built a little room on the back of my house, I didn't want to have a detailed plan to give to the city but I had to give them details or else they would not have approved it. And so I'm thinking, this is a lot of work. I gotta put down, I gotta draw it out to scale. I gotta make sure that I have enough studs on the wall. I have to make sure that I drill down enough holes in the concrete. I have to have the right thickness of bolts. I have to display everything. I have to draw all the different layers of the roof and everything about it. I have to make them understand that I can build that house according to code. But I'm not gonna draw every you know, detail out. I guess I could draw out a blueprint to scale. You know what that means? A blueprint that's as big as the house itself. No, no, no. No, it was one quarter scale. When God created the heavens and the earth, do you think he had a plan that was like one eighth scale? You know, like just a miniature universe as a sample, like this is a proof of concept. I'm going to try it out and see if it works. A little tiny universe. Wonder what? Oh, it's working pretty good. I think I'll do the real thing now. Like he had a trial run. This is what many engineers do. They call prototypes. Now, I'm just giving you the idea of what people think and how our human thinking can corrupt what the scriptures tell us. Because we know this, that God had a plan according to his will. Now, that plan, how detailed is it? You may say, eh, pretty detailed. Pretty detailed. Well, I'm going I'm to describe it a little bit like this. I do not believe that we can go back in time. I do not believe that we can go forward in time. Do you know what you have? Now is the day of salvation. Right now. Which is not now, it's then. Which is not now, it's then. We always are slicing into the future to make it to become the past. It's just the way God made it. Now is quite elusive to us. All we know is that 
when you can consider the word of God and consider your God and consider your sin, you better act accordingly. Repent, seek his face. But don't get lost in the philosophies of this world. Don't let that bog you down. Because I know this, for God to create the future. And what, am I, what do I mean by that? For us to go from moment to moment to moment, God has to do something. You may say, oh, no, no, he's just watching. What are you talking about watching? What do you think makes this world exist in the next nanosecond, in the next nanosecond, in the next nanosecond? What helps us to proceed? Why doesn't everything just stop and blank out? Everything is upheld by the power of God. How detailed is his plan that we can go on and make sure every subparticle, every electron, every molecule does what it's supposed to do, that works according to its design? If there is one subparticle or molecule on Neptune that does not obey the power of God, we are without hope. You say, well, that's kind of a strange thing to say. God is almighty, unqualified, almighty. And from this moment to the next moment, he executes his plan. He doesn't look into the future to guess, to say, well, I better have something ready for that because someone's going to do something bad in the Ukraine and then I better have this. And then it gets a little bit complicated. And, you know, that's the way people think. We are not dealing with a creature. We're dealing with the Almighty. And he proceeds with his plan until his plan is done. And it's not going to fail. Now, how does he know what's going to happen? I can tell you. It's in his plan. How does he know? It's in his plan. The works were finished from the foundation of the world. He foreknew that. He foreknew that. And we have a way of looking at the word to foreknow as to, to forelearn. That's not the same, folks. God does not forelearn anything. God creates. And then he executes his plan. Now, you can trust that, or you can live in fear and hope that God gets it right. Kind of like the roulette wheel. Black 21, black 21. You know, we're all rooting. We're all rooting for God to win. Rooting for God to win. God. This is why Paul is eventually going to say in this chapter, if God be for us, who can be against us? Because to foreknow is a little bit more than to look into the future or to predict. Some people type of, they, they think of it, I've heard uh, Bible college students uh, say this, well, God foreknew all possibilities, all possibilities, and when he saw all the possibilities of all the different random things and, and you know, having all that ability, he chose this one because it was the best one. Look, trying to figure out the mind of God is probably, to God, a little... And, you know, insulting that we, a creature, should decide how God is God. There is something unique about being a creature. We can be defined as not God. That pretty much sums us up. That sums us up. We are not God. No matter how well he made your eyes and your ears, it's according to his gift. He made you see according to his will. He made you hear according to his will. He made you feel according to his will. Your whole body, everything about you is according to his purpose. And you do exactly what God wants you to do. And there are many, many, I would say infinite, but it's not because God created all things and only God is infinite. And therefore, there's quite a bit, almost everything except what's in your little tiny sphere that you cannot see, cannot hear, cannot know, cannot feel, cannot understand. And therefore, there is something that God wants you to do. Trust Him. 
That means you just have to say, Thou, you know God, I don't. And there's only one thing that we can do is humble ourselves at the feet of the Almighty. Because God is more than just a powerful God. We, being made in His image, and having been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, now we have the senses that tell us, I need to know, but we can't know, but now you have the Spirit of Christ groaning within you, and He wants you to seek out the Holy God who is kind and merciful, and He wants the Spirit of God within you to tell everything else about you. Just trust Him. Just trust Him. You're never going to see enough to convince you. You're never going to hear enough to convince you. Nor feel, nor understand, nor figure out, nor discover, or read as many books, or be the great, if you were the smartest person who ever lived, you cannot even approach the hem of the garment to tell your heart, oh, I figured it out. I understand. I am as God. <laughs> we, under we know the same things. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. Therefore, the foreknowledge that we're looking at here. Do not listen to the science fiction writers to build your doctrine. It is according to his will, according to his purpose. The future has not happened yet. Now it sounds to me like, you know, oh, he sounds like he's saying that, well, anything can happen. The future hasn't happened yet because only those that say anything can happen will say the future hasn't happened yet. Look, the future hasn't happened yet, but it's not going to happen in any way. I know how it's going to happen. And you say, well, I thought I... It's going to happen according to his purpose and according to his will. That's what I know. But what is that? Well, he's told us some things, and he wants us to trust, us, trust him for everything else. And so, there are some things that according to his foreknowledge that he has told us. Now we're going to back up a little bit to verse number 28. For we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, there is some, I'm not going to preach this. I'm just going to give you the 15 cent sermon like I promised. It says all things work together. In, in woodworking, there is something that you, where you join two pieces of wood together called a dovetail. You know, some of you know. You know, and you have to cut it out to where the corners fit like this. It makes a very strong corner. And, 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 and sometimes, if you don't do it right, you got more dove left over than tail, or, or, or like this, or it doesn't go together. And, you know, that's what happens when you do it wrong. However, everything fits perfect in God's plan. All things work together. Now, we may say, oh, no, not. I, have, I can point out some things that if that is right, there's something wrong. Look, you can just say sin is wrong. If, sin allowed, if God allowed sin, and if God can bring glory out of sin, it's only going to enable his creatures to glorify him even more. Because some people feel that God needs to apologize for this world, and that God needs to be taken to task and to give an account for letting this world be sinful. You need to run away from that thought. Who are you and who do you think you are that you should address and approach the Almighty with such an accusation? A sinful creature who doesn't know anything except what they can see and hear and taste and feel and it's addressed by a sinful heart. And yet that creature is going to accuse God. Mm. We can be thankful that all things work together the way they're supposed to work, according to his will, according to his purpose. Now, they work for the good. Now, we may say, ah, there's a lot of sin in this world. Is it going to work for the good? Really? Is it going to work for the good? Well, it says it's going to work for the good not for everyone. You know what it says? It says, For we know that all things work, for the, work together for the good, not for everyone. 
Is that what your scripture says? No, it says, to them that love God. And you know what that is? That's not everyone. Now, a lot of people like to just say, you know, all things work together for the good. But you need to understand that what is good to some, they may say, that doesn't sound good to me. Because it truly is going to be good. Even the sinner who shall receive justice, that's good. But he may not appreciate the good. He may not say, well, as long as it's good, I'm good with it. No. He will call upon the mountains to fall on him, to hide him from the face of him of, with whom he has to deal with on that day. But it says that all things were worked together for the good of them who love God, not to those who hate God. Now that word good has to do with something that they will perceive it to be to their benefit. That's what that good is. It doesn't mean just and, and, you know, and unjust. Because God will be just to everyone. He will be just to his people and he will be just to the sinner. Christ is our righteousness and he will be just to them. And he'll also have mercy. But those who without Christ, they will receive justice and they will think that's bad. All things do not work for them to feel like this is good. It's not going to work that way for them. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, I like the way the King James says this. It says the called. Now, some people just read it like this. To those who are called according to his purpose. That's not so bad because they are called. But I know the difference between a verb and a noun. He's talking about the elect of God. All things work together for the good of the elect of God. And we will consider that they are called because it says in the next verse that they will be called and that God has called his people. And it's all according to his purpose. It's not according to God looked into the future to discover what he should do and then take credit for it. That's not what he does. It's not what he does. It, it, it isn't. You know, I, I saw this one film one time where they, uh, I guess somebody saw the results of a horse race. You may even know the film, and then they, they backed it up a few minutes, and then they made all the bets, and then they, you know, jilted people out of money and this and that, and it all had to do with, you know, manipulating things, right? God is not a manipulator. He is not a con man. He is not someone that wants you to think he's bigger than what he is, and all he does is, I got this time machine, and I'm going to look down and see what's going on. No. As his creation unfolds, as moment by moment comes about, God is in control, and he oversees and exercises sovereign power over his purpose and his plan. And it is so sure. How can God know what's going to happen a thousand years from now or a hundred years from now or 23 and a half minutes from now or five seconds from now? How can he know that in every place? Because it's according to his plan. That's how detailed his plan is. God knows what he's going to do. Known to God are all his works from the beginning. God is a God that you can worship. So we're going to be moving on from that, all according to his, uh, to his purpose. Now, we have to see that he did foreknow. Let's take a look at that verse again. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many, many brethren. I'm, I have a lot to say about that, but that's not for tonight. I'm just addressing the idea of, of foreknowledge because, you see, the foreknowledge here is that he ordained. That's a very similar word to the word predestinated. Okay? He ordained. He ordained that we should be conformed to his son. Because a lot of times people will say this, you know, if I was predestinated, what difference does it make what I do? 
If I get saved, there's nothing I can do that'll get me unsaved. Or I can try and try and try and never get saved because it wasn't predestinated. They think like a man. You know what? Don't make the mistake of thinking God is like you. Because it says here that the foreknowledge that therefore goes into the idea of ordaining and predestinating someone is that they shall not beat the system and say the magic words and still get to live in sin and not have to pay for their sin. Is that what it said? No. That they might be conformed to the image of his son to be saved from their sin. Therefore, the person or the sinner that tries to work the system and has not, shall we say, they are not ready to meet the God with whom they have to deal with because they're still thinking they can work him the way they work a salesman that shows up on their doorstep or work someone that, oh, they're coming to your business. Oh, you want me to fix your car? Well, they don't look like they're very smart. I'm going to make some extra money with this guy. You are not going to make any extra anything with God. You're not going to outthink him. You're not going to get the loophole. You're not going to work the system. You will either be saved from your sin or you will be judged according to his righteous judgment. You better face up to it. Face up to meeting the real God. Because those whom God is going to save, he will conform to the image of his son. He will do it. You think he can't? He will. He said, that's the peace that we have. Are you struggling? Are you fighting? Are you feel like you just can't get it done? Look at the God who's on your side. There is no way he can fail. And why is it so difficult? It's because he knows what it takes to make you into the image of Christ. He is the master craftsman. He is the one that knows how to do it. It is the great calling that he has that abounds toward you. It is the way he works and all these things will come and conquer everything that you think is going to make you fail. He will save you from your sin. For whom he did foreknow, them also did he predestinate or ordain to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, let's go on. I'm going to read a little bit more. Because... Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. So here's another 15 cent sermon, which I'm going to go back and preach this again, because there's other things to say about this. But when it comes to foreknowledge, he's going to say that the foreknowledge of God implies and explicitly says that he will predestinate, that he will call, that he will justify. And he will glorify. But some people like to take that word and say, he looked into the future. No, he did not. He knew. He knew beforehand because he had a plan. He did not discover it. He knew because he had a plan according to his will. And that's what I want you to get. So let's take a little bit of the idea of foreknowledge. Or shall we take, just let's take knowledge for one thing. I want you to turn to Matthew with me. Matthew chapter 7. It's a little philosophical tonight, but you know what? Sometimes we need to go that route so that you can guard yourself against being a philosopher when you should be a theologian. Matthew chapter 7. And I'm going to read, beginning in verse number 15. Now I'm going to read to 23. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns 
or figs of thistles. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings, uh, brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. And you may, you may be saying right now, I don't know why he's reading this. Okay? He's giving an illustration, or not a teaching, but he says, Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down, cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Now this is where the kicker comes in. Not everyone. Now he's just described a wolf. Okay? And he said, you look at their fruit, that's how you're going to know them. But these are the people that will come on the day of judgment and say, Lord, Lord, you know, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of, the, of, the, of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Now what does that mean? Does that mean, you know, you look familiar, but I just can't place you. I'm, wait a minute. I'm sorry, I just don't know you. You think that's what he means? No. The Almighty, who knows all things, he can say, I know who you are, and I don't know you. And I hope you understand what I just said. When it comes to God knowing his people, he knows. There is, in a way, a relationship between a man and a woman where a man knows his wife and a woman knows her husband. And no one else should know any other person like that. They should not know anyone else except the way they know each other. Okay? There is a oneness there. There is... There's a lot of things going on. And there is a way between Christ and his bride that they know. And when it comes to the heart that embraces God, that will rest in the Almighty and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And though I cannot know anything, I will love him and trust him. I can see, I know that my God is for me. I know God. I know God. And God says to them, I know this one. He skews evil. He, he, he takes my name and honors it. And he lives in a world where it vexes his righteous soul. And this man, I know him. And they know each other. God foreknew his people. He foreknew his people and loved them. He prepared with a plan to do those things to save them. He loved them. He knew them. The foreknowledge here is a lot more about the foreordaining of an affection of heart that has to do with saving sinners who hated him. And yet he abounded in grace toward them to save them from their own sin the foreknowledge of God that set in motion from moment to moment the preordination, the calling that abounds toward them on every side, the justifying work that gives them the knowledge that enables them to believe and to live for the glory of God and then the final glorification all because of a foreloving, a foreknowledge, a love that had a purpose even before God created anything, before the foundations of the world. God foreloved us. The foreknowledge of God. He's not looking into the future. He's making the future, moment by moment, bringing it in as he purposed. And it's going to happen, and you are on his list. I call it a list, but the book says that your names have been written down before the foundation of the world in the Lamb's book of life. There's a good list and there's a bad list, right? I'm not going to even go that route. But foreknowledge. I want you now to turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10.
I'm going to begin reading in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and cares not for the sheep. Number 14, I am the good shepherd. You see what's being implied here? I am the good shepherd. He's not a hireling. He owns his sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known of mine. This type of knowledge is something that we need to have. To know our God in this way is to trust our God and to bask in His love and to know and to appreciate and to, to feel the warmth of His smile. And then He knows us. I, we know Him. He knows us. And this knowledge was there in His purpose and plan before He said, let there be light. What an amazing statement, is it not? Let there be light. Let there be, and God created. And it was all very good. Very good. Known unto God are all His works from the beginning of the world. That's Acts chapter 15, verse 18. Known unto God are all His works from the beginning of the world. I'm going to end with this. And it has to do with enabling you to study your word, to study your Bible, and to understand it a little bit better than most. And it has to do with the way you look at the teachings that are contained in it. Sometimes you're going to find something that's in, that's in an analogy. You know what an analogy is? An analogy is a comparison between two different things, typically based upon the structure of it, and it it's designed to give an explanation or clarification. And what that means is something like this. We have the nation of Israel, and we have the rest of the world. Jews and Gentiles, right? Now, the Jews and the Gentiles, what's the difference? Well, you may, it, it all depends on what kind of question that is, isn't it? Because if it's a question that you're asking Paul as far as whether they are sinners or not, Paul is going to say, there's no difference. However, if you were to ask Amos, chapter 3, he says, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore will I punish your iniquities. He says, You only have I known. Of all the families of the... Does that mean our God is ignorant and He doesn't know anything about anybody else? He only was able to look at this one family and that's it? No, 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 no. But this is as also an analogy. You see, there is such a thing as, and I'm going to use a big word, an anthropomorphic type of behavior, a representation of God. And that means, anthropomorphic means that sometimes God presents Himself like a man to help us understand what he's like. And he's saying, he's like a father that loves his family. Or a God that has chosen a family, not all the other families. Now that helps us to understand. But you see, we cannot take from that scripture and say, every physical Jew will be saved, and every physical Gentile shall be lost. No. There is an analogy there. There is within this world right now those who believe in Christ and those who do not. One was, it's, it's an analogy. Therefore, and analogies are not perfect. They're not. Because you could say, like for example, Paul would say, the church is like a building. If it was a perfect analogy, then some of you are bricks and some of you are cinder blocks, and some of you are mortar, and some of you are head joints, and you know, and you have to get your little gifts and find out how we can stack you together 
to make a building. You know, analogies are not meant to be perfect. They're meant to teach a single idea. And therefore, don't let someone tell you, I believe the word of God literally. And I did that with this little accent there, you know, because a lot of times people on TV, they, they kind of get traumatic. But when I say, don't let someone accuse you of not believing the Bible literally, because I believe the literal truth that's taught in the Bible. And I'm trying to dig it out. I'm trying to understand it. And therefore, when we understand these things, and I read where Paul says, I mean, uh, the Amos says, of all the families of the earth, you alone have I known. Therefore, I'm going to punish your iniquities. That relates to Hebrews chapter 12, when it says, God dealeth with you as sons. And if you don't have chastisement, it's because you're not a son. That's how we can take that analogy and get the truth of it. God knows his children, loves his children. He foreknew his children and abounded in grace toward them. The power of God cannot be fathomed by the creature, but the creature can depend on it. We can rest in it. Just because the thimble cannot hold the ocean doesn't mean you can't fill it up. It can be filled up. You can be filled up with all the knowledge that you can hold. But don't think you're going to get it all. But it can give you all that you need. God is a God that we can rely upon. Never lie. And he loves you. He has foreloved you. He's abounded in his power towards you. And he's not a trickster, and he's not a shyster or a con man that looks out into the future. He is the creator of the future. So let's depend upon our God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace. Thank you.